I tell you, it would, it, I know you don't come there to hear me, see, because no one will drive that far to hear a preacher. You come there because that you, you believe the message and you believe in Christ. And uh, I appreciate that. I'm so thankful to have friends like that. I have someone who, who appreciates your, your efforts. That's what you're trying to do to, to drive that far over them conditions. The only thing I can say, I wish I told media, I said, I wonder if we could have all the people come from over 50 miles up home for dinner. See? I don't know what we do with them. See? Because the biggest part of our church, I guess 80% of them are you people. It's made up from Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, and uh, places like that where you come from. And uh, you think, and none of the people that come are rich people, they're just common people. And I know that takes a whole lot of your saving your pennies to do that. Because I know how much gasoline it takes to come and go. And besides that, to wear and tear on a car for the tr- round trips about, well, I guess it's about 1,600, 1,700 miles for one sermon. And come that each week. Think of that. See, I just, I feel about that little, honest, it's like a half inch high to stand before you to really tell you how I, how I appreciate it. Wife and I were talking. A few people didn't come. When I have service at the tabernacle, it wouldn't pay me to go down because there's more in this room right now than would be there if it wasn't for you people. That's exactly true. And that fulfills what the Scripture says in our own country among our own people. You, your, your respects and honor always comes from the outsider. I don't know why, but I don't mean the out, I mean from outside your own home. Of course, couldn't think of you all being outsiders. You're my fellow brothers and citizens in the kingdom of God. And uh, uh, here some time ago, I had a little old alligator stuffed up down here, and I told Brother Welsh I was coming down to get it, and the kids didn't get to finish their vacation, and I thought I'd run them down to Florida, down St. Petersburg in the morning, and on down, I want to go up Miami and come around over the Tamama Trail, and back up home, and they have to go to school right away, and I thought this would be a good time to stop by for the gator. And so Brother Welch, uh, Brother Fred, and Brother Woods came with me, so that would give me a chance to bring the kids, and they're going to take my gator back. And uh, I thought while I was down here, I'd just like to have a, your little group together to tell you how I appreciate you, how I appreciate your efforts. And Brother and Sister Evans, and Brother and uh, S- Sister... Uh, I, I get it. I call it S T. I know it's T S. There's a, a gargle mouthwash that they call S T thirty seven, and that's how I call you S T. Not from a. It's a, it's a good thing too. It's a dandy. It's got all the rest of them beat, to my opinion. They use it in the army, and I, I use it for about anything to gargle with, and for a mouthwash, and take it on a hunting trip with me. Where if my horse gets hurt, a poor little that. <laughs> you know, it's good for all around. I guess. You find him that way too, don't you, sister? Um, <laughs> all the way around. To wash the dishes sometime and so forth. And um, so uh, I thought maybe as tonight, I said to Brother Welch, what would, you, what would we say when the folks come around? You think, we thought maybe if you had a little question on your mind, just a little something that you could, maybe something that I could answer something that you wouldn't want to take maybe their time up at the tabernacle when you're there. Some little question. And that's what I dropped by for. So we know you go to work in the morning at 10 minutes after 9, so we'll get right into it. But before we do that, could we just bow our head for a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we're so glad for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who who saved our souls from a life of sin and has made us the citizens of his kingdom. By his grace we are saved, and that not by ourselves or by our works, but by his mercy we are saved. So we're so glad of that. And we know that someday we'll see him, for we'll have a body like his own glorious body, and we'll see him as he is at this time. Yet we do not know how that will take place, but... It's not for us to know. We only look forward to it by faith, and the whole walk is faith. So we're thankful for these things. We pray that you'll bless these people, Lord. As I drove down here, you know what was in our hearts last night, wife and I, as we talked along the road. How that blessful we feel to be to have friends that would 
a sacrifice to come hear the glorious gospel of the Son of God would drive all those hundreds of miles through a day and night just to hear one message. God, I pray that you'll give them each one a glorious home in the kingdom. Bless them while they're here on earth. Prosper them in whatever they do. May it prosper. And these young children, Lord, just little fellows yet, and many of them here in teenage, and yet they set with a reverence and respect as an adult. God, I think they're the best in the land. I pray that you'll bless them, Lord. May they never want for anything. And may in the great kingdom beyond, when the family is all gathered together, I'm sure they'll be there, Father. I, I pray that you'll have each one of them there. May they never turn from that great, narrow path that they've been taught to walk in. Grant it, Lord. Now, tonight, I thought, Father, we'd find out what's on the people's hearts. You know their hearts. And I pray, thee, Father, that you'll help me and to answer their questions, that it might be good for us, that it would be good for us to be here, and we could go along saying, Did not our hearts burn within us because of his presence? Come now, Lord. Walk around the chairs. Put your hand on every shoulder. Rub your nail-scarred hand across each heart that we might know that it's our Lord that's near. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we have a, a Bible here. I'd just like to read a, a scripture in here just for a minute to get a little start uh, before we get into the uh, lesson or the questions, rather. And this, I'd like to read this uh, a place I found this afternoon. I was riding up, riding with Brother Welch, and I up in the front seat of Brother Sothman's truck there, and I read something I thought I'd just like to speak of it just for a few minutes if I can find it in his uh, uh oh yes here we are in the 16th chapter of Acts and begin about the 37th verse but Paul said unto them they have beaten us openly I beg your pardon that's not just where I want to just where I wanted to start reading it I was reading a spot in here just to, I'll get it just in a moment. Here we are. It's the 29th verse. 28th verse says again. But Paul cried with a loud voice and said, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And they called for a light, sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and besought, and so, brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said unto him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. It's just one of these little twisting questions that I thought that I would like to speak of just a minute. Um, about thy house, being I see you each one so nicely have your house set in order, your your children saved, and and uh, uh, that's that's nice to have your family all Christians, because I we we want our families. We each one think of our children, and I certainly can command you, uh, fine people down here of your lovely. Uh, children, how you have them all in order and everything like that. Uh, how do you do, sister? And I believe this is, uh, wasn't that mother just come in back there? The Lord bless you. I'm glad to see you again tonight. And I believe this is Brother Willie's wife, isn't it, right? And that's the boss of the family right there, as I understand. It. Or that's the way it goes at our house. <laughs> and to have your house. Now, Paul said here to, um, to this uh, Roman centurion, uh, when he was, we find out that Paul had been beaten the evening before, com commanded by the magistrates, and had been beaten because that uh, he had done nothing evil. He had been up there preaching the gospel, and uh, the clergy there had it against Paul because he had preached the gospel, and they said he's turning the world upside down. And um, he went down the street as a little fortune teller, a woman with a, a spirit of fortune telling. 
and uh, she was hard to tell these fortunes. And when they were going down the street, she cried after Paul and say, they're a man of God who tell us the way of, of life. And uh, Paul didn't need the devil to assist him in anything, so he just turned around and rebuked that spirit in the woman. And when it did, oh, that caused an uproar. And when they found out, the, the spirit had left her, and she could not tell no more fortunes. So uh, the, the one that had her heart out there and was probably taking care of her, why, it caused a great uproar, and they were beaten and put into jail. And I can imagine Paul and Silas laying back in that old buggy jail on the inner courts way back the outside where the best prisoners was kept was bad enough, but they was on the inside, and when they went way back, they was putting stocks. I don't know, would you all ever see stocks? I've had the privilege of seeing them. They, they put them in your, across your feet, and then they put them across your hands, and then put them across your neck, and there you are sitting there. And the Chinese capital punishment, the way they used to do it, is very cruel. They'd put them in those stocks and put a drip of water, just one drip at a time, falling on top of their head like that until it just drove them insane. They'd sit there and give them nothing to eat or drink like that, and their, their eyes would turn and everything. It's just a horrible thing. They say the first few drops, of course, for maybe the first day it isn't so bad, but they say after a few days that those drops, like 50 tons fall in your time, hit right in that same spot because you can't move your head. You're in those stocks. And just think that Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel was laying back in that old dirty place and probably rats and mice and bugs on them and everything. What a place for a man preaching the gospel. And we think today that we complain because we have things a little hard. Look what they did. And knowing what was waiting and perhaps execution the next morning. But they were faithful. They, they, were, they stayed faithful. And long about midnight in there and uh, I can just think of how they must have felt their backs sticking to the old dirt were prisoners and there's leprosy and everything else and, and in them days and laying against the old hard floor, might have been a dirt floor, rats running over them. But in the midst of all of that, perhaps no supper, and beaten till there's bleeding and bruised and sore, no doctor to wash out the wounds or anything for infection that we'd use today or something like that. Just throw them back there and put them in the stocks and put them in that condition. But they wasn't complaining. Not one word of complaint came from them. And knowing maybe the next morning that the magistrates would probably uh, call them before the emperor and when they did or the Sanhedrin and they'd be executed for preaching this heresy that was called in them days the gospel that we truly earnestly contend for that same faith today. And um, then when we go to thinking about that, then the miles gets a little shorter between one another, you see, each time we go to thinking about it. And um, then we uh, find out that along about midnight, uh, Paul and Silas uh, must have talked about the Lord until about midnight, and then they begin to sing hymns, some good old Christian song. Oh, if we'd sing it today, we'd sing there's power in the blood, or oh, how I love Jesus, or something like that. And when they begin to sing, all of a sudden an earthquake struck the place. And notice how it done. instead of piling those walls of that big old building right in on top of them and, them and mashing them to death, it shook the walls away from them. And not only that, but it, it, it broke the stocks and bars loose from them, and they were set free. I think over their feet, over their hands, and over their neck, they were set free, every one of them. And instead of that big old heavy Roman prison breaking in on them, it fell away from them like this. And not only that, but the shackles and things fell off of them. See, that's our God when we hold out faithful. See, we must stay faithful. And as long as we're faithful, and you know, we, not, we may not be in that kind of a shape. We, none of us may get, I hope we don't get like that. But we can be faithful in what, we've got to, what we have to go through with. Maybe it's a persecution. Maybe it's somebody laughs at you. Maybe somebody says, you're old time, you're holy roller, or whatever they might want to call you, or make fun of you or something. Let's be faithful just the same, because God respects our faithfulness to that just the same as he would respect their faithfulness to what they, were, they had to go through with. And then all of a sudden, when the Roman prisoner, the centurion, must, uh, must uh, the guard at the door, he must have thought that, that night when Paul and Silas were talking on Scripture, he must have learned something because he didn't know the man. But he must have known some way or heard their singing or something that caused him to know right quick 
that they were a holy man. Because, you see, they, he was a Roman, and they were Jews, and he was a pagan, and they were Christians. But did you notice, as soon as he found out that there was that the prison had been shut down, and he noted he'd have to answer for that a century. You remember the time of Elijah when he had himself disguised and met King Ahab out there and said, I was a sentry, and my life, of course, was staked with the man, and he got away, and, and uh, he said, well, you pay for it then with your life. That's the duty of a sentry. So he unwrapped himself and said, he was Elijah, the prophet, and said, you let it, the, the king go, Agag, and he said, you, you'll pay with it with your own life, and he did do it. So then... Uh, we find out that this Roman centurion, knowing that he had answered with his own life for these, he pulled out his sword as soon as he found out it gone and started to kill himself, take his own life instead of have to go through punishment. Some of those, maybe setting them the same kind of stocks and so forth until he died. So he thought he'd just end it all up and jerk out his sword and kill himself. But quickly, Paul screamed out when he saw it and said, Do yourself no harm, for we're all here. See? And the man realized then that there must have been something taking place before that that made this man to know that they were Christian man or holy man because quickly he fell down at their feet. I'd imagine he heard them singing songs. He heard them testifying. He heard their conversation. Now, let's just think a minute, folks. If that Roman centurion was convinced and convicted because that he heard them two men beaten prisoners, are we still free? And we're not beat or prisoners. But hearing their testimony had such an influence till it caused him to say, what must I do to be saved? Then what are we to do with our influence? See, we should be testifying. You young people, whatever it is, you may not preach. Maybe God never called you to preach. But you, if you're a housewife or whatever you are, a teenager, let, let's do something, you know, that, and, and live a life that makes the people say, well, that, that's a Christian going there. That, that's a Christian. And um, so we find that this fellow must have been impressed some way by them songs or whatever they were doing in there to realize they were Christians. So um, he got a light, and when he come in and seen that there stood Paul, and even the prisoners back in there, none of them was trying to get away. Everybody was there. So he, he put up his sword and fell down by the feet of Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, did you notice, you and I today, and most all ministers or so forth, we're always trying to tell a fellow what not to do. We'd say, now, quit your smoking, quit your lying, quit your stealing, quit your this or that. Now, that, that wasn't what the man asked. He, he didn't say, what I have to quit doing to be saved. He said, what must I do to be saved? See, we try to tell them what they must stop doing, see, and say, well, I must uh, do this, that, or the other. No, see. That is the question, what must I do, not what must I stop doing, but you just do what you're supposed to do, and all the rest of it will take care of itself. You're lying, stealing, or, or drinking, gambling, and doing the things that's evil. It'll stop when you do what Paul answered his question. What must I do to be saved? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy, and thy house shall be saved. Now, the reason I thought about saying this, because... You people here, most of you, your, your children are saved. See, they're Christians. I have admired Brother Evans' family, these young men here. Usually, who would you get a teenager to sit around and listen to someone, a preacher talk? Well, they'd be out and gone somewhere. Little girls like that. I said to Brother Fred, his kids, why, well, they, they can just hear me say one thing, it's wrong. They're, they're, they're ready to stop it right now, you see, and set with the highest respect instead of being out a uh, hot rodding, rambling around. They'll, when they hear you speak about the gospel, they're ready to sit right there and listen. See, now, I know we all won't think our kids as renegades and things like that, but we we must stop that. I, I believe it. We must remember that these kids are the best kids in the world because they're our children, and we claim them for God. Now, your salvation will not save that child, but now Paul said, said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy and thy house shall be saved. Now, he, now, what did he mean by that? He didn't mean that because they were saved, that their house would be saved with it. He meant this, that because 
they were, if he had enough faith to be saved himself, his same amount of faith that he had for himself would work for his children. See what I mean? Now, I've got my children. There's my little son, Joseph, Billy, Sarah, Rebecca. Well, now, I want to see each one of them a worker in the gospel doing something. I want to see them saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I've committed them to God and say I'm holding on to God for them. See? And I believe they're going to be saved, every one of them. See? I believe they're going to be saved, and I'll have them on the other side. And uh, I don't believe my salvation will save them. No. But my faith in God will do it. You see? My faith believing God will do it. And it calls them to come to Christ. And I believe that's where you people, praying for your children, and that's the reason your children has the, the manners and the, and the real lady and gentleman in this uh, wild age that we're living in, yet they have that, that uh, part about them. It's the best I know of any kids. See? Well, I think the reason of that is because it's your prayers for them and you've committed them to God and holding on. See, now the Roman said, uh, what must I do? He just asked for himself. He said, what must I do? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou and thy house shall be saved. See? Now, now we got one thing to do. Let's drop back just a minute to get something to drive in on my text. Now, it's this. Let's take an old man that I know of in the Bible by the name of Job. Now, Job was a great man. There was nobody like him in his days. Job was a prophet. And uh, people come from far and near to hear Job. And God blessed him, and he is, he is prospered, and he is a rich man. Oh, he had thousands ahead of cattle and sheep and, and the things that he had. And uh, while he said when he would go uh, out into the streets, the young princes from the east, that's the magi, uh, the wise astronomers, you know, they were saying, said they would bow before him just to ask the word of his wisdom. See, he was a smart man. He's, he's a prophet. And um, so uh, the devil looked down and he saw that it, Job was a smart man. So uh, I'll show you how a, a smart man does. Now, coming back to the text, die in thy house. Job said when he seen everything was just in good order, like your homes are now, he said, uh, you know, my children's married and gone off. I said, maybe one of, uh, provincial one of them might have sinned. Now, there's one requirement God had. That was a burnt offering. He said, now, I don't, he didn't believe his children sinned, but said, provincial they might sin because they're visiting one another and going to the parties at one another's homes and so forth and mixing up, I guess, and so forth. He said, if one of them has sinned, so, Lord, I bring a burnt offering and offer this burnt offering for my child. See? And uh, that's all they know to do. That's all God required. A burnt offering. That's what all he required. Well, then, when the great midnight hour come and struck and poor old Job was in the condition he was, he, you know, he lost all of his cattle, all of his sheep, and the storms come and killed his children, fire burned up his servants, and, and he broke his own health, failed, and he sat in the backyard on an ash heap, and, and his own bo body broke out with borrows, so he took a piece of crock and scraped his borrows. And even his wife uh, got discouraged with him. He come and said, Job, now let, let's just kind of think the way she said now look, there sits Job. He sat out there all night. There sits uh, uh, his consolers with their back turned to him. And they've told him he's sinned. That's the church member. That's uh, the deacon board or whatever it is of the church. Come down to see him. And uh, they sit seven days there and still tell him, Job, you might as well make a confession because you have sinned because God wouldn't let a righteous man be tormented like that. But God does let a righteous man be tormented like that. See? God, sometimes it, it, things happen to us because we sin, but sometimes it, it's testing a saint instead of chastising a sinner. So we find out that Job was a righteous man, and God was testing because Satan said, Oh, sure. When he came up before God with the sons of God, he said, God said to him, Where you been? He said, Oh, just walking to and fro and up and down on the earth. He said, You consider my servant Job? He's a perfect man. There's nobody on the earth like him. God was pleased with that. Oh, he just loves to have a servant that he can trust in. He said, there's not another man on earth like him. See? He said, he's a perfect man. And that was before the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. See? And he said, uh, he's a perfect man. He's just. He's upright. There's none like him. Satan said, oh, sure. Look what you've done for him. You give him everything. He's got homes. He's got children. He's got 
cattle. He's got everything he wants. Sure, anybody could serve you like that. He said, let me have him one time. I'll make him curse you to your face. He said, Satan, he's in your hand, but don't you take his life. Now, that was God's trust that his prophet would not fail him. Amen. See? And he's trusting you and I that we won't fail him. And then he, and he said, don't you take his life. And Satan done everything but take his life. His children got killed and his cattle killed and uh, everything, is, all of his riches was lost and he lost his health and everything but his life. Sat out there and scraped his borrows and his wife come to the door and, and uh, Satan got in her and said, uh, thou, looked out there and said, why don't you curse God and die? Said, uh, uh, you look so miserable. He said, thou speakest like the foolish woman. Now, he's never said she's foolish. He said she talked like one. See, said, you speak like a foolish woman. said, the Lord gave and the Lord taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, in other words, naked came I in the world. He said, naked I'll return, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Anyhow, I never had nothing when I come here, and I'll go away with nothing, but still blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, my. You know, God will just let Satan tempt us so long, and then he gets tired of it, you see. So he's seen he could, Satan had to leave him, man. But the Abinadrad and all of them still stayed there and said, well, he's a sacred sinner. But Job stayed pat on this. I am not a sinner. See? Job, you, you're done, you don't want to confess it, see? Because you're a secret sinner. You're doing it secretly and God's punishing you for it. So that's the reason that uh, things are going for you the way they are. But he said, no, sir, I'm not a sinner. Because he was standing pat upon that righteousness of God, that burnt sacrifice. He had offered it. That's all he had to offer. That's all God required. And did you notice? As the Spirit of God had come on the prophet, and everything got all right, you see, God restored back to Job what? He restored back to him. His, where he had 10,000 cattle, he gave him 20,000 cattle. Where he had 40,000 sheep, he gave him 80,000 sheep, see? And he restored everything back to him that he ever had. And you notice, it said, and he restored his seven children. See? He gave Job his seven children. Not, didn't give him seven other children, but he gave Job his seven children. Now, what was it? His house. Thy and thy house. Because... He was righteous because he was standing on everything that God gave us to be righteous or gave him was to offer that burnt offering. And he knew that that was God's word and it could not fail. So did you ever think where them children was? They was in heaven waiting for him. See, he's with them today. And God saved Job's children. They were in heaven waiting for him. See, now, if Job took an act upon the very thing that God told him to do, the only thing it was to be righteous, was to offer a burnt offering that was righteous, and he saved Job and his house. Then what is righteous before God? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy and thy house shall be saved. So if I'm believing for my house and you're believing for your house, by believing that uh, we trust God, God imputes our own faith like he did Abraham or Job or any of them, for righteousness, you see. So it's allotted to us for righteousness, and that's how that thou and thy household shall be saved. Oh, I think it's a wonderful thing. So then, not only that, but I'm holding for every brother, all my brothers, my sister. I'm not only holding for that, but I'm holding for every person that's in my church. I'm holding for you all. I want you to hold for me. Because of the righteousness of faith, we don't have to make a burnt offering. Christ is our offering. But we have to have faith and that's offering it Christ made, that he made us this kind of a, a promise, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, that I'll do. When thou prayest, believe that you receive what you've asked for, and you shall have it. Now, if I'm praying that God will save these teenage children, and I believe with all my heart he'll do it, see, that's the same way Job stood. Say, oh, look at this kid. I don't care what he's doing or what she's doing. I still have put that child in the hand of Almighty God and my, me and my house shall be saved. See, because I, even though I may pass on before they do, but somehow before they leave here, God will twist them right down on the trail. I, I believe that somehow or another. He'll make it so miserable for them until they have to do it. See, and um, that's why I believe it's thy and thy house shall be saved. 
I've seen a many that I watched that come into my meetings. Many times, an old boy come up there has been rough all his life. He fall down on his knees and go to cry and get up. So I had a dear old mother. Oh, if she's in heaven tonight, I know she's looking down and she's glad to see me at this altar. See what it is that old mother prayed and believed. See she's gone all long ago, but here's them prayers because the righteousness. See, thy and thy house shall be saved. God knows how to work. He knows how to do. He knows how to do everything just right. As I said the other day, when we are born of the Spirit of God, God isn't weak in one place and strong in another. If you've got a little shadow of God in you, just a little speck of God, then you've got all power. You've got enough power in you to make a world and go out and live in it. But of course, that power is controlled by faith. If it wasn't, we'd all have us a world out there living in it. But if you're a son of God or a daughter of God, you've got the power of God in you. See? So then you, um, that law holds that faith to a certain thing. Now, let's take, for instance, all of us, we say, we once lied, we'd steal, we'd, we'd uh, curse and swear and do everything that's wrong. Well, one day when we accepted Christ, what did he do? He opened up as soon as we accepted him. That's a faith, just like Paul told the Roman to have, believe. Just exactly what Job did, believe, see? And as soon as we accepted Christ as our Savior, immediately we received enough faith that we walked away. No more lying. No more stealing. No more cheating. See? No. Why? We rolled right up above that sin that we used to ride in there. We was a lot of that much faith. Why? Because that we believe that we are saved. Is that right? We believe here that we are saved. So then we ride up above that because we believe we are saved. Now listen to this just before I get to the question. See? Brother, sister, I'm going to give you a little secret on myself. I guess you've often wondered how I see those visions and things. What makes it? It's because when he met me that night and told me that, see, this would happen. I believe it. I solemnly believe it. And I go in to pray for the sick. If I can ever get a feeling that something's fixing to happen, they're fixing to get well. So always it's about right. And that's the way we must do with our family, with anything that we ask for. We must pray, and God respects faith. You see, to believe it, we must believe that it is right. Now, with that little bit of God, when you said, Yes, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy of your love. But you did love me, so I accept you as my Savior. Immediately, you walk right out of there. And what is it? You stop your lying. You stop cheating. You stop stealing. You stop doing things that you oughtn't to do. Why? Because you believe that you are a Christian. And because you believe you're a Christian, you rise up from that you're to another level. Now, see? Now, if you're sick, you're healing. You just believe it. Now, you can't make yourself believe it. It's got to be something happened to you, just like your conversion. It's got to happen. I was telling my wife the other day how much I loved her. So, uh, I don't guess she wants me to talk about this, but uh, I do it in private, so I guess I can do it in public right now. I tell her how much I loved her and uh, how I always have loved her since the first beginning. I said, it no make any difference. She said, oh, Bill, she said, how, talk about how fat she's getting her hair turned gray. I said, honey, you could be that wide and no hair. I'd still love you just the same, see, because it has to be something there that you have to... Has to, you have to meet that you love somebody. And unless that person loves that other person, this is for you young girls that's not married, see, and you boys. When you meet that girl that you love, and it's just something you know you love her, and that's just all there is to it, or you love him, and that you don't care whether he's handsome or whether he's not handsome or whether she's pretty or not pretty, that doesn't matter, but you love him just the same, you better watch, kind of hold around close there, because that's, you're getting close to home there. And I, I, uh, a, a marriage based outside of that is sure to fall. Or it'll never be successful. It'll never be happy. Amen. Now, I said that to get around to one thing I want to say. Friends, a conversion outside of the same thing won't last either. Amen. It won't. When you go to church and, and you say, Well, uh, I'm going to join church and I'm going to be baptized. If that isn't coming from a heart of love to God, the honor, it'll never go nowhere. You list all you'll do is join church and be baptized. But when you're converted to Christ, a love to Christ, then you accumulate a faith in Christ like you would to your wife or to your husband. You accumulate a faith that you walk in that faith. I don't know. You just, something about you, you just got a, something that anchors you there, you see. 
Well, that's the same way it is about Christ. And what Christ says, you believe it, and you just stay right with it. And that's where it just raises you right up above it, and God brings it to pass and fulfills his promise. If thou believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thy and thy house shall be saved. So now I just thought I'd say that. Now, I don't talk up too much of the time of it, 30 minutes, to say that. But you know what I mean now. That's what it is. If you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, not only for salvation for yourself, for your loved one, for the healing of the, the child, or for a mother, or for anything that you desire that's right, and you know if you desired something that wasn't right, you, you wouldn't have faith enough to ask God in the first place because you know it ain't right. See, if you're sincere and know that it's right, then you can ask God with a clean heart, knowing it's no selfish motive and your objective and a motive is exactly right, then ask God and like a child, believe you get it, and you get it. I know that. I've come to Christ when I was about the age of one of these boys here, I guess. I was about 20 years old. And I, uh, I served him all this time, and I'm 52. It'll be 53 my birthday. And I can sincerely say that I have never asked Christ sincerely for anything. That is, it's now that really sincerely asked him anything was for right, but what he gave it to me or told me why he couldn't do it. And then later on I found out it was a good thing I didn't get it, see. But just remember, when you believe on him, have faith in him and trust him, don't, don't try to shove yourself to do it. Just stay with him and reason it out. Like if, you, if I was coming to Brother Welch here to borrow you, a thousand dollars. I guess I couldn't get it because he may not have it. But if he had it, now nah, I could get it. Now I'd come and try to lay the case down. I'd come and say, "Welch, give me a thousand. That's no way to do it. That's the way to ask God. I'd come up. I'd take to Brother Welch. I'd say, "Could I speak to you a few minutes, Brother Welch?" Sure, Brother Bram. Go over to one side, sit down, say, "Brother Welch, the first thing I want to ask you: Do you have a thousand dollars that you could get a hold of for me?" Well, he, if he, we, we're friends. Or he'd be asking me, or maybe him, or one of you, brethren. It'd be the same. We'd say, yes. Now, here's why, what I want. I'd lay down and show him. I'd say, Brother Welch, I'm over here in a meeting. I'm absolutely up against it. I, I got to leave the town, and I'm a $1,000 in debt. I, I just got to have the money from somewhere. Now, the Lord put it up on my heart to come to you. And I'd explain to him. Now, now from another meeting that I had at a certain place... I've got a thousand dollars coming in, which will be about three months from now. I can pay you. I'll pay you interest on it if you want it. Just lay it all down and explain it to him why. I don't want to leave that town like that. It's a bad thing on my name if I do that. And then they're going to say he's nothing but a cheat and a steal and, um, and leaving the town, owing money. See what I mean? I'd explain it to you. Sit down like a brother and talk it over with you. Well, I believe if I do that and, and you like me as you do, you, you'd do anything. You, you'd pawn an automobile or sell something out of the house to get the money. Now, see, you'd do it. Any of you would, and I would for you. But it would be the, the right thing to do is come sit down and talk it over one another, let, let you know, you see, express our feelings to each other. You're my friend. That's the reason I come to you. Now, that's the same way it is, but Christ, say, you're my Lord. I, I'm, I'm sick. I, uh, the doctor says he can't do anything for me. But, but I know you can because you're my Lord. And... Um, uh, and just uh, speak it over with him until you feel then that it, it you receive it. And that's your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I, when I feel that way, it's just as good as I got it. Sure, I'll go ahead because I got it. See, I didn't, uh, he's done promised me that I got it. So that, that settles it. Now just keep on holding on, waiting. Finally, first thing you know, here it comes pouring down out of the cars of heaven and you, you got it. But that's it, you see. Thy and thy house shall be saved. And if you don't see them all saved before you leave the earth, you'll, they'll be there when you get time. When the great coming comes, it'll be there. Now, you understand what I mean, see? It's by faith we do everything. Believe on the Lord. Believe on the Lord for a job. Believe on the Lord to hunt, oh, the, give you the wife that you should have. Believe on the Lord to give you the husband you should marry. Believe on the Lord to send you some new furniture. Or if the... If the barrel goes empty and the cruise gets dry and there's no food and the children are hungry, believe on the Lord. Believe on the Lord for anything. See, as long as it's right, just believe on the Lord and thou shall. See, it shall come. I've never seen it fail in all my life. God bless you. How about you reading some of them questions for me? Could you read them for me? Uh, I hope I get these right. I don't want to keep you too long now. About, maybe about 10 minutes. And, and um, give him, Jimmy, a little time to study him over there and see if I...
And uh, they're going to be ask me right blank, right out. And so if I can't say them, well, you'll understand. But you understand what I mean now to believe? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thy and thy house shall be saved. Believe for yourself and believe for your house, and you shall have it. Say, uh, well, the doctor said I can't get well. Well, if thou can believe on the Lord, you can get well. Well, uh, I'm out of work, but if you believe on the Lord, see, and uh, uh, you shall have work. And uh, I don't know what to do about this situation. Believe on the Lord. Look where it sits with me right now and why there. I've always thought the Lord wanted me to leave Jeffersonville. Now it's got to a spot that I just had to commit myself to him. So here I am. He knows where I'm at right here tonight. So where he wants me to go, I'll go. He wants me to do, I'll do it. And I'll be right along until he tells me, you see. All right, Jimmy, have you got him, my boy? Yes, yes. Well, all the family go in the in the rapture. See, yes. See, now if you notice, the rapture is going to be a universal thing. And uh, how, did you all get that lesson all right, Sunday? You all understand it all right about how close we are at the time, the seventy weeks of Daniel. You all were there Sunday, wasn't you? All right. Well, um, I think, brother Welch, you got the tape of it, and some of you could play it, and, and you got the map of it, I believe, haven't you? And you just uh, draw it out and. And to them, it wasn't here. Maybe explain it to them, you see, so they can get it. I want you to see just by the Scriptures that I've got one word to say into it. The Scriptures just prove it, that we're, we're at the end time. Now, I uh, was talking today to the brethren. You say, well, Brother Bram, if you believe that the rapture is that close, then why do you go fishing? If I put my mind to it constantly, it almost run you wild. When you think of the tens of thousands of people out here in sin that don't know Christ, and I think, here I am, what can I do? But here's what I think. I cannot save one unless God called them. See? I can't do it. And I couldn't save them anyhow. But all the Father has given me will come to me. So if he don't tell me where to go, then what can I do? See? So the thing I do, just not be, not be all weary about it. That'd be worse than ever. I'm happy about it. I'm just, just all packed up and ready, you know. When it comes, Lord, here I am. I'm just waiting. And now here's what happens. The, the raptured saints, as you notice on the chart Sunday, now, the early Pentecostal brethren, or the late Pentecostal brethren, don't give that, those back churches room enough there, I don't believe. But I believe that every born-again Christian, and how are we born again? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, see? And except, now, I don't believe just because you say in your mind you believe, I believe your life tells whether you're really a Christian or not. Uh, you say, what, uh, uh, today, uh, the lady down there said something about being a, a Christian or something, and she said, and what denomination? See, right quick, they want to know what denomination. I said, don't belong to any denomination, just a Christian, see. A Christian, you say, well, a Christian means a Camelite. No, that's, that they just call them Christian, but that don't mean Christian. I know of many people that I think belong to what was called the Christian church that wasn't Christians. And the Christian ministers will tell you the same thing of the Christian church. They got many members that are not Christians. But Christian is not a church that you belong to, it's an experience that you have had of being born into the family of God. Now, notice in that the rapture will be universal because he said there will be two in the field and I'll take one and leave one. There will be two in the bed. I'll take one and leave one. You see, when it's dark on one side of the earth, where it's two is in the bed, it'll be harvest time on the other side of the earth when there'll be two in the field. See? It shows it'll come one great big rapture. It'll come right out from the world, see? Two in the field, and I'll take one, leave one. Two in bed, I'll take one and leave one. Now, we, um, we see that, and then every one that was found written in the book was delivered in that day of that, before that tribulation. So if your children, your mother, your loved ones, whoever they are, if their name is written on the Lamb's book of life, my precious children... You'll be right there. No matter where we're at, if, uh, if I'm flying overseas and uh, the airplane explodes in the air and I, you never even find a piece of me in, in, in this body, that won't have one thing to do with it. See, I'll be right there just the same. Don't you worry about that. I'll be right there to shake your hand and 
and praise the Lord with you. Crown him King of King and Lord of Lords. See, I suppose maybe of Paul's body there isn't even a speck of dust left, hardly. But all the materials that made his body up is somewhere. So they'll be gathered together at that day. When you die, you actually do not die. A Christian cannot die. There's no such a thing as death for a Christian. Not in the Bible. Like when Lazarus, they said, they said, uh, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, Jesus said. See, he never said he was dead. He said he sleepeth. They said, oh, well, if he's sleeping, uh, I suppose he's doing all right. Then he must be getting along better. So he had to talk their language. He said, now, and otherwise, in your own language, he's dead. And I'm glad for your sake that he wasn't there. I'll go and uh, waken him. See? Oh, yeah. See? Sleep. See, he still had his own. See? For your sake, for your way, you know, it, he's dead. But to me, he's asleep, and I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not going to raise him up. I'm just going to wake him. See, I'm going to wake him up. And um, so, uh, uh, you, you notice, when Jesus himself died, see, there's three parts of the body. So, uh, for three parts of us, soul, body, and spirit, as you've seen the seven church ages, I had to draw it out. Five entrances to the body, CT, feel, smell, and hear, and conscience, and so forth, to the soul, and, uh, and then to the spirit. There's one avenue. That's uh, uh, your own free moral agency. That's make a decision, you see. You can turn it down or, or you can accept it. And um, so now, um, when a person accepts Christ and is saved, your whole household, your whole family, every family of the earth will be saved. Now, when, or go in. When Christ died, he committed his spirit to God before he left the the cross. He said, Into thy hands I command my spirit. And the Bible said his soul went to hell and preached. That's his conscience and what he was. The spirit was in prison and his body went to the grave. Now see, he was behind a barricade of scriptures. He couldn't rise for three days. And his spirit was back up here in the presence of God. Now after three days, that barricade was taken down because the scriptures fulfilled and his spirit went to the soul and the soul went to the body. He rose up. He said, before he died, he said, I have power to lay my life down. I have power to take it up again. Now think of it. Every one of you in here as far as I know tonight's Christians. Now look, the thing that's in you now, the spirit that's in you now is the same spirit that will raise you up. You have power to lay your life down. You're doing it right now for Christ. And then you have power to take it up again. Yeah. You have power to lay it down, power to take it up. For it's the very Spirit of God that's in you that raises you up. It's the very Spirit of God that was in Christ that raised him up. So you have power to lay it down. You have power to take it up. And when you die or and you, our loved ones or somebody goes on ahead of us, they're not dead. They're spirits with God. Their souls are under the altar of God. Their body's in the grave, and they know right where it's at. So what happens when the Scripture's all fulfilled? Like in the Bible, it said, These souls are in the altar of crying, Lord, how long, how long? They want to come back to earth and be in bodies. He said, Just a little longer to your fellow servants that suffered like you have for the testimony of Christ. Then you see, when that Scripture's fulfilled, then them spirits descend right straight out of the altar there and take up that soul. That soul goes right down and picks up the body, and there you are, raised again. Think of it. The Holy Spirit that's right in this building tonight, the Holy Spirit that's right here in my heart, will raise me up at the last day. This Holy Spirit that's in me now will see to it that I have a young, immortal body and never go. This Holy Spirit that's in you will see that the gray hairs will fade away and whatever it is in you. And the old age, if you're so old and whiskers down and walking like that, that don't make one bit of difference. That same Holy Spirit is smack it right back at that day just to the young man and woman. That's the Bible. The Spirit that's in us right now. Right now. Not one that will come, the one that's in us now. It's God in you now. And He will raise, you can raise yourself up. And why can't you do it now? Because, see, the Scripture holy, you got to wait to the rapture. See, there you got to stay right there. See, you're not allowed to get this high. If it would be, but well, we, I said we'd build us a little private world. You'd be living over one world, me on another, and then there would be no coming of the Lord Jesus, and what would it be? See, but you have power to do it. Just at least a little shadow of God could do anything. Because, see, he, he is omnipotent. You know what omnipotent is? Uh, uh, infinite. Infinite. Infinite, omnipotent. That's uh, infinite. You just know it. Well, you, you just can't explain it, you know. 
infinite. It's, it's like on a camera, infinite. It's just from there on. And then uh, uh, omnipotent is all powerful. Is all you know, stand out here and looking through a glass, and I can see 120 million years of light space. When that uh, when that uh, astronomer take me up to look, let me look through that big glass that night, I could see 120 million years of light space. Well, you talk about Jupiter and Mars and these stars that you see now. Oh my! Think what 100 light travels about. What is it? 80. 186,000 uh, miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. And take 120 million years. By one second, 186,000, and break it down to 120 million years. And then what do you got? That's miles. <laughs> oh, oh, my. It just makes us feel like you're, you see. But now, and then beyond that, there's just as many moon and stars as there were. And he holds them with the power of his own word. And that very same thing that holds them is in you as a Christian. Amen. Oh, my. See? See? There you are. So that, that's who you are. See, people try to think, well, I'm a Christian. I guess I have to beat the dog around. No, you don't. Amen. You're a Christian, brother. That's a high. You're son of God. Our Father's king. Amen. Certainly. Amen. And our Father being king, we're, we're his sons. We're prince and princess. Amen. To a king. See? The highest there is, highest can be. The very Spirit of our God is in us. That's it. So what do we care about what happens here? See, there's the place that counts. This is just a testing time. The Father's finished. Let's go. Let's go home. See? So what difference does it make? So then in that, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ if your children isn't saved until they get saved. And Jesus said, now remember, St. John 5, 24, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall not come to the judgment then if you don't come to the judgment where does he go? in the rapture because okay? well, that's a judgment after the rapture see shall not come into the judgment but has passed from death unto life because he's believed on the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yeah. so they, your children will be there with you your loved ones will be there with you and I hope I'm there with you <laughs> amen alright have you got another one there Jimmy Boyd? We understand uh, the world was made by faith. Will you please explain a little about faith? Uh, a, a world was fashioned. Now, over in Hebrews, we find out that we understand that the world was made by uh, by things which do not appear. Now, uh, I'll try to be quick because I didn't notice all them little, uh, all them questions there. Now, let's just take go back on a little trip and. Um, and uh, it's already 10. And I told Mommy I'd be ready to go for 10. Are you, are you sleeping to wait just for a minute or two times? Well, look. Before there was anything, let's see, before there was a light, before there was a world, before there was a star, before there was an atom, before there was a molecule, there was God. Who is this person God? Is he air? Is he light? Is he, he's God. That's just all you can say. See? Just think, a molecule is, in one little atom there's so many molecules. See? And then beyond the molecule, before there's even one of them, there was still God. Amen. He was all filled everything. See? Now in this God, and we're gonna we're gonna make it a little a little form so you see now inside of this this person God, inside of, of this person was uh, there was uh, attributes. And them attributes was to be father, was to be a healer. Be a savior. That's what was in this great person now that was before a molecule or anything when it was no molecules. But there's still God. Now in there was attributes to be father, to be a son, to be a savior, to be a healer, to be uh, all those things. Now this person that has this, now if, if this person God, now what he did, the first thing let's say he made it as far as we know, as small as we can break down, was a molecule. Now, if you made a molecule, you made a hundred billions of them in a second. Just, what did he do? He spoke it into existence. And now, you, you, here will be a good lesson right here if we just had time to go into it, see. Now, he spoke it. And when he said, so, molecules went to turn. Then he said, let there be atoms. And there are atoms, laws. And they still stay in that law. Their trails still traveling. Everything travels in God's laws. Like the man I was telling you about the old fellow, Brother Banks Woods and I, when I was seeing, talking about the 
I asked him, he's the infidel, and I asked him, how does that sap leave the tree in August and go down in the roots? What makes it do it? He, what makes the leaves turn brown? He said, because the sap, he said, what, why does the sap go down? He said, well, it's just, uh, it goes down. I said, what if it don't go down? He said, the tree would die. I said, well, what intelligence makes that sap go down in the roots? Put a bucket of water on the porch and see if it'll go down in August. <laughs> see? I said, what intelligence makes that sap leave the tree and go down into the roots? Something tells it to get down there or it, it, it'll freeze and die. A tree will die. Yeah. See, we had no cold weather or nothing yet. But it, they said, well, it, it's just the nature. Well, what is nature? Tell me what nature is. See, nature is a law of God. Amen. Yeah, it's a law of God. Now, faith is a law of God. Amen. See, the same thing. All this power of God that we're talking about is accessible to us by faith. All things are possible. Say this mountain be moved and don't doubt your heart. Believe what you said come to pass. You can have it. Accessible. If you've got the law, there it is. See? The law is faith that controls all things. Now, God by His law made molecules. That's the law of God. Then God made atoms. Then from that, God made a sun. From that, out of the sun made uh, stars. Out of the star- That's little pieces of sun flying off. What did He have way back there? Is this attributes displaying themselves. Then come a world, and after the world come a creation, and after creation come a law to creation. After there's a world, what makes this world? How can anybody explain it? Turn a ball any way you want to. Throw it in the air, it won't make two turns. It'll make it a billion turns per second. It'll not make two turns in the same place. And yet we got record of 6,000 years. This world has never missed a time turning 24 hours. Just exactly. Standing in nowhere. See? What is that? This great person before there was a world. Before there was a world, that's that great person in there. A law of God making a turn. The same law of God, he just spoke it into existence. He's a creator. He creates. See? And that's why that the world was made without... By faith, God made the world because his own faith, see, made the world. And that's how... Now, he see, he come down making man and all animals... Till he come down to sin, but he could not make sin. Because he cannot be righteous and the father of righteousness and make sin. So you know what he done? He made man in his own image and knowing that he would fall, but put him on a basis of free moral agency. He said, I don't touch this tree. Now he couldn't say, now he knew he was going to touch it, but he couldn't tell him to touch it because he said, touch this tree, you live. Touch this tree and you die. See? And he knew man would fail, but yet he couldn't make him fail. He had to do it on himself. So that makes God righteous to see man fell himself. If he made him supposed to himself, he put him on a basis of free moral agency, and therefore that's where he fell. By his own free moral agent act, he fell. And today, each one of you children, and each of us adults, is placed for them same two trees. We can accept life or refuse it. See? So God just spoke it into existence, and the world was framed this very floor. is God's Word. This thing here is God's Word. Our bodies are God's Word. And everything there is, is God's Word. See, because it all originated from God. All right, sir? Uh, now, if that isn't right, if that don't clear it up, well, you, you can write me a note bring me to yours. All right, uh, Brother Jimmy? 1 Corinthians 16.22. 1 Corinthians 16.22. All right, sir, just a minute. These um, these little uh, these little studies um, in the scriptures really could help us. It could it can strengthen you and make you make you strong, mighty man. Sixteen, you said, son. That can be. Um, oh my goodness! I don't know where I can pronounce that name. Out A N A T H E M A M A R A M A T H A. Somebody got another Bible. See what it's broke down. That's. And uh, what I say? Anathema. Sounds like that would be. What is it, Fred? Get the get another. Somebody got another Bible? See if it's in there. Yeah, anathema. anathema. Well, what is an anathema? Now you got me. You know, Fred. Anybody, any of you all know what anathema is? Got a dictionary? We can find it just a minute. Get a dictionary. 
All right. While he's getting that one, maybe I can answer another. All right, sir. And I beheld Satan falling from heaven like lightning. Over Luke, is what it gives scripture there. Yes, well, I suppose that's what it is. I beheld Satan falling from heaven like lightning. Now, that would, uh, I'll kind of outline this. If it doesn't do it, then you, you just let me know and I'll go into detail. Do you remember? We, we'll get that when we come into further on into the scriptures on our study. Well, there, and that, You know, Jesus, that was immediately after that uh, Jesus gave his disciples power against unclean spirits and they went out casting out devils sent them two by two and he said don't go to the Gentiles but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel and as you go preach in the kingdom of heaven and heal the sick and cast out devils and so forth well then and then they come back rejoicing happily now you had asked the question oh that's where it's at see come back happily rejoicing and he said and he said rejoice not that your names uh, rejoice not because devils is subject unto you but rejoice because your names are written in heaven he said I beheld Satan falling from heaven like lightning see the power of that church moving forward had just upset the whole kingdom of Satan you see and he saw him as he dropped from his places because God had again give power to his church to go to it he beheld him falling like lightning from heaven his cast plumb out of the holy places and everything you see by the power of the, that uh, power of that church of them having power, Jesus said, "I give you power over unclean spirits." See, and they really upset the kingdom of Satan. What could we do with it today? Oh, praise the Lord! All right, brother Jimmy, maybe you got another. Flame blood into the horses, bridle. Bridle bits, Armageddon, in Revelation. Now, in the last days. We come to a place when Titus in AD 70 taken the walls of Jerusalem and tore down the uh, walls of Jerusalem. They claimed that there was so much blood spelt among that right at a million or more Jews it was inside of the walls until they killed even women, babies. Well, it's so bad till they, they'd rejected the Holy Spirit. See, now God, when, he, when they rejected Christ and called him a Beelzebub, he said, I forgive you for that. See, I forgive you. But said, someday the Holy Spirit's coming to do the same thing that he was doing. Said, one word against that won't be forgiven. Well, what they do on the day of Pentecost, they seen those people screaming and dancing and acting like they were drunk and screaming and shouting and going on. What they say, they said, they're full of wine, they're drunkards, and all I could ask to. And they made fun of them and called them everything. What happened? It sealed them outside the kingdom of God. See? And then when that siege of Jerusalem came, now we go get that in Revelation 7. We'll come right back to it. Everybody asks the question. We'll come right back to it. And then, um, and when the Titus taken the walls of history, says, on, on Josephus, the early historian who walked the days of our Lord Jesus, and he was a great historian, he said that even that the blood flowed, just gushed out from the gates like that. They killed so many of them in there at one time when they went in. Now the Bible predicts that in the last days that he'll trap Catholicism, Romanism, and all those things, and them communism, and all of together in the valleys of Midio there, until there'll be such a slaughter amongst them, until the blood will flow to a horse's bit, horse's bridle. See, that's in Revelation. That'll be, in, but thanks be to the Heavenly Father, I don't think we'll be here, but His grace we won't. We'll be in glory then. See, that'll be right after the, the, uh, the uh, two prophets is prophesied in the battle of Armageddon. That's when these, when these Gentile nations get so wicked, just keep on, and the confederation of churches and all this come together, and God will take the church, the elect church home out of every one, and all the sleeping virgin will be wait. Now that bridles bit there will come out from the sleeping virgins and all them back in that day in communism when they're all meet there and God said he'd plead with them like it is in the, in the days gone by you know there in that valley and that's where it'll ride to the bridle bits of the horses um, did you ever get that word did they, or they're still or, go ahead sorry. Why don't, why don't three unclean spirits? Uh, they come out of revelations come out of the mouth of the false prophet and the dragon and so forth. Now, we're going to get that in our study. I see the three unclean spirits and three isms. Let me type it for you now. And you'll see where, where it started, where it began. See, there was communism, fascism, Nazism. They were spirits. Communism is a spirit. It gets on you. 
See, it's a spirit. And that, it'll be something like that, only I'd, uh, it, it, that really isn't it. But it'll be three spirits just like that, which they was kind of a forerunner of. But, of course, you know, where it's, it's in Catholicism, you see. But I'd, I, I want to get a few things on that straight before I say it, you see, to be sure that I know what. But it is three spirits. It's like communism, fascism. And when we brought that out years ago, you know, remember I told you, I said it would be a... It would be a, a thing would take place would be all wind up in communism and that's where it's done that's the same way it'll be at that time see it'll be the three unclean spirits that'll go forth it uh i really truly believe right now just uh, kind of outline it if you don't mind and if i if i add a little more to it when i go to explain it will you say you didn't explain it all together down there that night see if i do that here's what i think it'd be i believe it's a spirit the sleeping virgin, confederation of church, Judaism on the rejecting of Christ, the Jews that rejected it, and Catholicism. Because you see, where it come out of it? It come out of the false prophet. See? Out of the mouth of the false prophet, which was the popery, a matter of the beast, see? And all that, where it come out of, you can see the backgrounds where it is, and that's the three unclean spirits that sets the whole world to Armageddon. Amen. See? And that's them three unclean spirits. And you get that right in with the three woes. Remember the other day I was brought in, I said, be seven last plagues, seven seals, and three woes, and two, uh, three unclean spirits. And that, that comes through that. Okay, we got another one, have you? So, what significance does the uh, Euphrates River have through the Bible spiritual Yeah, the Euphrates River, it's always been a great river because the Euphrates River has a great place in the Bible. The first place we find that it run right through Eden. The Euphrates River did. The Bible says it come right through Eden. The next thing we find out, the Euphrates River also was a river that come right straight down through Babylon. Same river. See? Euphrates River. Come right through Babylon. Now we find out that the angel poured out his vial upon the Euphrates River and dried up that the king of the north might come down. And... Um, I think what that will actually be will be at the end time when they come into Armageddon. See, they have to come right down through Egypt there to get into it, and right down through them countries. They'll have to cross the Euphrates to get in there. See, the Euphrates River runs today. We, we know that, you see. And, uh, and the Amazon, South America, and the uh, Nile and Egypt, and the Euphrates, and the... Uh, oh, what is that? There's two rivers there and at, uh, headed up there at the head of Eden. And uh, the Euphrates River is when this great made uh, way for it to come down. See, making way for the king of the north to come down, the kings. That'll, be, that'll take place during the time of the battle of Armageddon in the last days, you see, that Euphrates River. Was that all of them? Or did, that was all of them? Now, um, uh, just in my mind, see, about that, uh, what this person is, if they reject Christ, it's just uh, you might look it up for your own self in a... In a in the dictionary because it's not something that uh, it would, uh, I wouldn't speak it out right out here now but you look it up and you see what it means and you could just in other words there's two or three places in the scripture I can refer to you things like that like in other words um, like uh, King Nebuchadnezzar said any man that wouldn't, wouldn't bow down to this so and so and the Daniel's God and everything let his house be taken away his children burned his house made a dung hill see and um we realize what those words are. They're just brought out and said like that. But uh, if you just look back in the dictionary, it'll, it'll tell you just what it is to see what that is. Well, um, these little old things are enlightening. And I, I, I didn't put as much on them if it, as I should have stood and put because, you see, it's a... It's uh, everybody, y'all working tomorrow, and I'm going the Lord willing to Miami, and uh, it's a quarter after ten, and I don't want to hold you too long, and I think my youngins are asleep, and I guess yours is too, and so the, there we are, and and uh, uh, little fellas get sleepy quick, but I want to say that them is real, real nice questions, everyone, I'm real good, and I wish if I have a another question night or something other at the tabernacle that you all if I mentioned that morning you would give them questions over to me so I could uh, could get a little time to study my show it's just offhand then you you start talking and I'm a great person to take too much time on anything 
And uh, you, you notice uh, my technique in preaching, that's the reason I keep it there all day, you see, nearly just preach too long. But uh, uh, did you notice Billy Graham? Now, Billy Graham's a trained preacher, and he's a great man. And uh, Billy Graham, he'll set his text right there. He'll back off out here and just keep hammering to that text just constantly all the time. He'll never let his voice drop hardly. Just keep hammering into that text. See, that's the way the Holy Spirit has him preaching. See, that's his technique of doing it. That's the way he does it. Charles Fuller, many of you have heard him. He's a wonderful old man. And um, so Charlie Fuller is a, like a Bible expositor. He's a, he likes to, to teach and to uh, how he goes about things. You know, and everything is lays it in Christ and a great old teacher. You know, that's what he does. He doesn't preach. He just teaches it. Well, now, if you notice the little simple way that I have it, I set a text out here. Whatever my text is, I go way back out here and get my context. I bring it over here and lay it right in line with my text and go back over here and get something else. Bring it over here and lay it down over here and I go back over here and get something else till I get it all down here to write and then drive it home on the Texas all at one time. The reason I used to have these little old sermons I used to try to preach, of course, you've been around me long ago, I'm not a preacher, but uh, like a believer style this, speak to the rock, come see a woman, and all I can you know, just little three words, just... I'd build it all around about the woman at the well and what it was and hit right down at the last and see, come see a man, come see a man and speak to the rock. I'd take Israel and bring him out and see, get my context and put it over here in line with my text. Never hit my text yet. And um, you know, it's a while ago and explain, explain that this a while ago. Same thing on that Roman there. See, uh, saying, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. See, that's the question, being saved. See, I went back and got what all that was and pulled it out and went back and got Job and all of them and pulled it over here and, and the road and then drive it down. That's what it is. It's faith, you see. Job used faith. The Roman used faith. We're better to use faith and everything. See, just... And I think that way, if I am doing it, uh, to my way, if I can get the people interested enough to listen to what you're trying to build to, then save your main texture for the last point and then drive it in and say... Oh, the rest of it opens up because you see, you see it. See, you just, you reach over here and got a loose line and pull this one in. And the uh, trouble of it is, I leave too many loose lines <laughs> that I don't get. Well, it's really been nice if you all come down here and sit and talk with us and everything. And I appreciate it. And I want to say again with all my heart, I mean this with all of me, I never realized what a great thing you people are paying. I, I just, if it wasn't for seeing you and wasn't for loving you and the things that I do, I'd say, I ain't going to preach that tabernacle another time <laughs> to see y'all have to drive 15, 1800 miles a trip to go and hear a service. Now, I appreciate that great loyalty, but yet I think of what you're doing. See? Mm. And I, I just trust to God that every one of you in the land beyond the river. You and your children, your little ones and all, and I'll, I'll see you over there. I hope I'll be there. I'm trusting I'll be there. I'll see every one of you. May, may not one of your children be lost, not one of you lost. May we all be there at that day. And, and even to our little sister out there, the little, little colored lady out there washing the dishes out there in, in, in the other room. I, I remember down here one day talking to that woman, I believe. Is that the same woman? And her husband, I believe. I met, met him over there one time. I know it's a boy it works for you. Seemed to be a fine little old guy. And I, I just hope we'll all meet there where we, uh, there will be no disappointments. No more setting up late at night because there will be no night. Oh, my brother, sister, if I could just, if I could just anyway explain what it was that morning when I was laying there beside my little wife there, and, and he lifted me up from that bed and tucked me up there and let me look up past the curtain. If I could only just have the power now to explain to you what that looked like and what it was. I seen them all there. And they were all young, and I, I couldn't recognize them. See, they was all coming up to me and putting their arms around me and everything, and they were, they were human beings. See, they wasn't some kind of a feathers like a, they say an angel. I don't think an angel has feathers, although they just, they just say that, you see. But an angel's a messenger. And, uh, the word means a messenger. So I don't think they have feathers and things like that. But it's just, uh, they were all there, and they were all happy, and they were no, could not be nothing else but happy. And if there was no more than that, I would, it would pay us for all the running and things we do and, and all like that. But I want, you, I want to say this, that I believed, too, 
that the Bible said in the last days there will come a famine in the land. And that famine won't be for bread and water, but for hearing the true word of God. And people run from east, from west, from north and south, seeking to hear the word of God. And we're just about living in that day now. See, when Not disregarding anybody, you see, not disregarding our churches, no, sir. But if you know, I believe that in the pulpits of many of these churches, we have fine man, good man, real man of God. But they're afraid if they say anything that's contrary to what that organization says, then they'll be kicked out. Then they're left in the cold. And I believe what the man needs is some courage. And I believe it. Well, I believe God wants to take somebody and make an example to show that he'll take care of them regardless of their organization. So that's what I hope he'll do with me <laughs> to help me, to let me. And if I, and listen, Christians, if ever one time I, I, I charge you before God and the, and the elect angels, that you, if any time that you see that I'm doing something wrong, won't you please come tell me? Because I, I, I love you too well to miss you over there, and I know you're going. So I, you come tell me. If you see me in the wrong any time, something that I do that's not right, something to put a stumbling block in your way. Now, there's a lot of times I get around here and laugh and cut up and say things. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to let off some of that wound up feeling in me, you see. Just, it isn't that I want to do that, see. It isn't that I want to even laugh or and come down here and get with Brother Welch so I can hear him tell a little something other about uh, all the... A little boy, a color boy out there, and he caught a fish, and the warden caught him. He said he's catching turtle bait, and and like, uh, something you know, on that order. And the little when that little preacher told me, I was telling them the little girls today about the little poodle dog being Fifi and Fifi. You see, and and uh, like, what am I doing that for? To to laugh, make myself laugh, to to bring myself down. When you step above this mortal rim, up into them rims, there, it, it's. It keeps you in a twist, you know what I mean. And then you think, here it is, this thing. With this ministry, you remember what I'm going to have to answer for? Not just for Tifton, Georgia. Not for Indiana. Not for the United States. Now I got to answer before the world. For a worldwide ministry. See? I got to answer to the heathens. I got to answer to God for the heathens, rather. See? And when I get set at home, think, well, I believe, I believe, I believe... Uh, like the other day up there, and I get so wound up, and I said, I, I'm going on to have another meeting, and I go on to have another meeting, and the first thing you know, I'm so wound up, uh, I, I got to go hunting, I got to go fishing, I got to get out with somebody, I, I got to do something, because I'm just a man, just a human being, you see, and that, that's what, you understand that. But if you ever think I get anywhere out of the way with it, you come tell me. I'll stop it, boy, like a clam, of, no matter what happens. Because I, I want you to understand, I have no secrets. Everything that I know, you know too. See, all that the Lord has shown me that He will permit me to tell, I've told it, and I hold nothing back. And and my life is open. You you know what I am and what I'm made out of. And I'm just try to live every day the same as far as I can. Of course, a lot of times you see me when I'm moody and I feel bad and tired and weary or something like that. Of course, I. That goes along with the ministry. You know, you realize that. If you look back through the pages of time, you'll see that, man, that way, did that way. We all get those. But the thing of it is, we want to understand one another. I realize that you have your ups and downs, too. I'm not the only one who has them. You have them. And when you're having yours, I'll try to understand. When I'm having mine, you try to understand. And um, when I'm overseas somewhere, way out in a meeting somewhere, and uh, Devils are everywhere piling up and challenging me and everything else. Why, well, you all remember, just pray for me. Will you do that? Can we have a little word to him now? Heavenly Father, it's been glorious to stand here and talk to this bunch of blood-washed children. I realize tonight I'm standing just like St. Paul stood many years ago. Little house meetings where they come and Paul come over to Quilla and Priscilla's and and how they must have had gathered the people in. And he went to Rome and had a house rented. And he received those that come in. And here tonight, the people from, it comes to the tabernacle. And, and uh, the people that drives all these miles that I've just been trying to uh, tell them how much I appreciate it. Lord, I don't have words even that I can tell them with how much I appreciate it. But, Father, I pray that you'll let them know in their hearts what I mean. Dear God, if... Please, I pray that you'll answer my prayer for them. 
Save them, every one, Lord. May there not be one of them lost or any of their families lost. May they every one be there. I pray for their little ones. I think this little boy laying here in his daddy's lap, his mommy sitting watching, and think of the days it is to come. If there is a tomorrow, how do I know that same little boy won't pack the gospel? God, I pray that you bless the little lad, all the others, the little girls and boys, and be with them all. Be with Brother and Sister Evans that's opened up their house, house of prayer. Be with us now and forgive us of our sins. And God, if they ever get sick and they have to call, God, let me live such a life that they'll believe that you'll hear me. And then hear me when I pray for them, Lord. Grant it. And hear when they're praying for me, because I need their prayers, Father. And every time they're praying for me, won't you hear, Lord? When I'm praying for them, hear, Lord. And together we'll serve you all of our lives. And in that great day, we hope to come up to your house someday. And when we knock at the door, won't you let us in, Father? Until that time, watch over us and bless us and keep us ever true. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, folks. And I'm sorry you kept you here until, until all, almost 10.30. This little lad here sleeping like a little trooper. How is it? Do it. Are you just down where come in? Well, I see you again, you, Brother Willie. Brother, guess you'll be leaving out in the morning. Yeah, you'll take my, my uh, alligator, right? See you up Brother Woods. Lord bless you. You, Brother Scott. Nice to see you again, Brother. I believe I've seen you before somewhere, in there. I thought I had your face in from here. Brother Wayne, Lord bless you. And I still think I ought to fill up your tank with gas. Oh, coming sure. down 80 miles to bring us minutes to do. Bless you, son. Bless you, sister. And all my kids, you know, I'm kids, you know that, don't you? God bless you, Sister Evans. That's really nice breakfast and supper in your fine hospitality. Remember, Jesus said this, In so much as you have done unto the least. Now, he here said, In so much as you have done unto the greatest. See? So that might that be somebody else. But in so much as you have done unto the least. See? It might be me. So you have done unto me. Nice seeing you again, too. Ever I, oh my, how could you say it wasn't your mother? You look so much alike. Nice getting to see you. I believe you are the wife of the this young fellow there. And um, your brother Scott, are you all sisters? Well, I thought you were sisters. I sure did. Nice getting to see you again. Keep up a good courage, my brother. And uh, hey, maybe this is a new or not in order. this girl here. That's my niece, my sister's oh. daughter. Well, I'm glad to meet you, sister. The Lord bless you. Nice seeing you, sister. And uh, you'll be good for something. This God bless you, brother. Brother Evan, God be with you, boy. I want you to get our young and you better get going. God bless you, my brother. And um, I tell you, before we go, let's just stand up to our feet and sing a little song. Put a sing a little verse with me like that. Is it all right? Sure. Yes, sir. God be with you till we meet again. By His counsel I uphold you. With His sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet. Oh.
tape down there. Mm-hmm. Well, I wish y'all come go to Florida with us. Lord willing, I, I tell you what I'm doing. I'm trying to take the kiddies out. You see, they're, they didn't get to finish their vacation. Their grandmother had a heart attack and we had to come back. So therefore, I'm taking them out to kind of finish their vacation because they got to start in school again right away. So I'll uh, take them somewhere tomorrow, maybe down at St. Petersburg or... Mm-hmm. Some more I got to get back, maybe before Sunday. They've got some of them stalks down there, I think, you know, in the museum, you know, what oh, you're talking about. Yes, like well, I'd like to go up and see them. That's right. I haven't been in the museum now. That's at, uh, what was it? Ripley's. Ripley's Museum. And that's at St. Petersburg. Oh, uh, St. Augustine's. Yeah, Saint, I mean, it's St. Augustine's Day. Yeah, I go over here. This is Jacksonville's where I go first, isn't it? Yeah, back to this Yeah, back, because I get this thing <laughs> turned around. Back this way to Jacksonville, and then I go out to La Crosse, you saying out through that way? Out through which? Way Was Cross. Way Cross. Cross yeah. mm-hmm. uh, I mean, the fact you asked, uh, uh, Mitch Magic just turned around. Uh, which way is the tabernacle face? The tabernacle face is east and west. You're coming in the east. You're, you're in the, you're when you're coming in, in from the, the front, you know, where 8th Street runs up this way, you're going right east down. And then, the, uh, then if you step, and when I'm preaching, I'm preaching towards the west. And see, I do that so the altar would be to the east because Jesus is coming from the east. And then that uh, that lets me uh, uh, the altar we bow always to the east. See, uh, usually I don't know. It's just what I always did. I seen the Bible. They usually back there. Daniel said he went and pulled up the windows, you know, and everything like that, and prayed it to, to the east. And and uh, so. Uh, and I noticed in the old Mosaic Temple, I think, faced the east, the altar did. And so, of course, God will hear you wherever you are, you see, regardless. I just never could get the rest straight. Yes, sir. When I, I have seen a time when I'm prayed up and everything, I, I just don't I just don't get turned around. See, I just come around. But now if I'm not watching and anything like that and just go down and jump at it, I just, there's two, one place that I know of, but I can never get straightened out. And yet I know where it's at, and that's down at Grandma Cox's. <coughs> I can go down there and I just can't get that straight. And there's going to be something looking to me like happen there someday. I go right here at this gate and it's that's just as due south as it can be, turning to my right. But it isn't. See? It isn't. It's vice versa. See? And uh, I, I just... And if I get into woods now like I get lost or something other, and then if I turn around, now if I get all excited, well, I, I can't do it. See? But if you just stand still a few minutes and say, Heavenly Father, help me. And brother, I can just direct that to you. Just this, right? One time I come out of Brother Woods and Sister Woods is coming out of Chattanooga. And Brother Woods is driving on, I guess that's 41. Yeah. He's going back. So I, I was so tired. Oh, I was so tired. And I lay down back after the service and lay down back there and went to sleep. Back the car. I woke up and I raised up. I said, Fog, you couldn't hardly see your hand before you. And I said, hey, Brother Woods, you're going wrong. 
he said, he said, just come out of that meeting. And he said, uh, he said, uh, oh no. I said, I'm going. I said, I'm going 41. I said, but you're, you're going south. I said, now how can you tell my fault like this? He can't even see the road. I said, but you're, you're, I can tell right now that you're going, you're, you're going south. He said, no, no. I said, yeah, it's 41. I said, but it's wrong. Well, we drove on a little piece and he kept arguing with me. He's right. So I said, I'm staying around 41, going to Memphis. And I said, uh, uh, you just watch. And we pulled in filling station. And I said, uh, uh, how far is it to Memphis? He said, you have to turn around, boy. You're in Georgia. Say, go on. Let me go right. I if you don't notice, I remember one time I was lost up in the mountains, and that's when I, I thought I was too good a woodsman to be lost, but I really got lost. And uh, my wife was with me and Billy Paul's little baby, and they, I left him. And I went, I went to hunt a bear. See, and I was hunting a bear, and I, and I ran into a big buck deer across there. I shot this buck, and I thought, well, I better get back. And I know I'd come down. I was up in the Adirondack. I went up the mountain like this, and I, something crossed the road is a, is a mountain line. And he just laid his ears back, and just before he, uh, I got my gun up quick enough to shoot, he got away, see. And Amelia had never been in the woods in her life, see. And, um, well, it was on that uh, honeymoon time, see. And I worked a good one there, see. The same time I got married, then I could, you know, take her on a honeymoon and go hunting the same time, see. So, so, so I, and I, I thought, well, now, now, how did I go? I, and I come up this way and turned down and went over and hit a ledge and went out through a little pocket. And I know it was down towards the giant somewhere, towards the Canadian side, but uh, I didn't know just where it was at. And it uh, come up a storm. And all at once, you have snowstorms. And oh, the fog was slow. You couldn't even see your hand before you. And that's when you, in that country, you better sit down if you don't know where you're at because you'll die right there at sea. And uh, just get your place and hold up, get something to eat, and wait for a day or two the storm's over, and then get out and see where you're at. So I couldn't hold up me. He was in the woods, never been in the woods before, and a little lean to, not even a door to it, just you know, a little lean to, like that. So there I was in that shape. Oh my! I got went. I started right up like this. I thought, well, I turned off up here somewhere. I come right back to where I shot the deer. I took off again. I said, I've got to find my way out of here. My wife and baby will die in the woods. See, it's turning cold, and that's the fall ripping through, which is gonna be snow just a little bit. See, and I started up again. And I come back to the deer again. Done it three times. Well, I knew then. I said, well, I, I'm go, I, I'm somewhere. See, now the Indian calls that the death walk. You're on a flat place and you're walking around around a circle, see. Now, with a compass, you wouldn't do that, see. But uh, you're walking around a circle. The Indian calls it you're on the death walk, see, because you just get frantic then. That's when they lose their mind and start running, screaming and everything, and they finally plunge over a cliff or something and get killed or either kill themselves. And then um, I, I remember I said, well, I'm going right straight. I, 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 you know, I got kind of delirious, and I thought, sit down. Why, well, you old fool, you know you're not lost. You you can't get lost. You see, and I kept saying that. But that see, it just wasn't there. There's you know, something that isn't there. You can't bluff it. You know, just like, and so I said, well, I'm not lost. I know exactly where I am. Sure, I come right in this way. That's exactly right. Going along, talking to myself like that, you know, and just sweating as hard as I could. Now, if I'd been by myself, I just went over somewhere and pulled in a little place and waited till storm was over, maybe a day or two, but been all right. Got me a piece of my deer and let her go, see? But you couldn't do that in the wife and woods, never in the woods. Well, they'd die that night. They wouldn't have to take care of themselves in the woods, see? So I thought, I just go along there and I heard something say, I'm the Lord of very present help in a time of trouble. I just kept on walking. I thought, now I'm getting delirious, see? I'm thinking I'm hearing this. This just was first married 20 years ago. I just kept going like this and said, I'm the Lord of very present help in a time of trouble. And said that three or four times. And after a while, I stopped and I thought, it either I'm beside myself or Almighty God's got mercy on me. I just knelt down and set my gun down. And I said, God, I confess I'm lost. You see, I said, I'm lost. And I'll never, I can never get out of here. But I thought I was too good a woodsman to ever be lost. But I said, I'm completely turned around. There's no way. I got excited, you see. So there's no way at all for me to ever find my way out. And I, I don't deserve to live, sir. But my wife and baby does, see. So help me to get to them. So if they won't die in the woods, I said, I don't deserve to live. But they do. And, uh, and uh, I said, if you just help me, I'll be very thankful to you. I got up. I said, now I'm going to set my face right this way. And I know I'm going straight towards to where I left meeting them. But I read it wasn't going right into Canada. See, I'm on a death walk. See, I'm going right into Canada. And I started like this. And all at once, I thought, go. My hand, I said, who's that? And I looked up. And just in time to look back. And just enough fog cleared away to I seen the top of Hurricane Mountain. 
and they was camp just below here came out. Well, then I just stood there and wept like a baby, praising God, you know, for helping me. And then I had to take out that way, and it got dark on me, and deers and things jump up from me. But I had, and after it got dark, I know the ranger and I from this ranger's cabin is right there. But that lean tube is locked up. And then that's, that's 25 miles from the closest house from there on down, see. And then up here on the mountain here over the ranger's cabin, then on up to the tower up on the big peak up there. Well, I know I was on the peak somewhere. Well, then mountains are many, many, many miles around, you know, 30, 40 miles, 50 around the mountain there. And so I thought, now, if I can only hit that wire that comes down across there, he and I put up for a call, you know, tack it on the trees and it goes down to the station and they relay it from the sta- from the from the tower, you know, down to the station, and he's coming up in a few days to bear hunt with me. And it got night, and I couldn't see, you know, and it dark, and I got dark in about 30, 40 minutes. It was only about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But I'd hold my hand up like this, and I'd walk, and I'd just get it, hold my gun in this hand and walk. You know, I know that wire is just about this high before we tacked it on trees all the way along. And I thought if I could just hit that wire, I'd hit a limb, and I'd catch myself. Uh, no, that's a limb, see. And I'd try again, then when I change, my arm would get to ache and hold up so long. I'd change and put my gun here and step back a couple steps, you know, be sure that it didn't overstep it, still be close to it. And like that. And brother, long and done, pitch black, dark, you know, and I've been walking about an hour in that dark, and my hand hit that wall. I felt it. Well, I just bowed my head and started crying, you know, and I thought, Lord, right at the end of this line waits my wife and everything, see. I thought, that's right. And I stood there and held my head down, thanked him for it. I thought, yes, Lord, I got my hand in yours. It's a current, a line. And right at the end of this line that I'm holding out in my heart holds everything that's dear to me. See, all my loved ones, my Lord, my Savior, all that's dear to me lays at the end of this line. So I wouldn't let my hand get off that line. I followed that line right down the mountain. All those little, little bro- half-broken trail there where we come up, you know. But I wouldn't trust that. I just held the line. When I get a tree, I'd keep it right around the tree and catch it again. Go on next tree catch it on down. About three miles down the mountain. And I got down there and Meaty was almost in hysterics, you know, just... Uh, such a fix but that's it see there's nothing no feeling like being lost what about lost being lost in the woods but what about being lost from God well meaty come on honey brother Welsh has to go to work and Banks and I will probably want an early start and all these other brothers want to go to work get the kids all the work thank you thank you if you enjoyed it half as much as I did talking with you, it was wonderful. Brother Wells, thanks for that nice time this afternoon, too. We had out there with the take me out to the and gator swamps out there. Sister, you all, I sure thank you for that nice supper. Thank you for coming down. Oh, <laughs> you got a little girl in there too. She's got the prettiest hair. I know she had a kind of a real yellowish gold looking hair. That, that's really pretty. I want to comment you on your hair too, sister. No, it's fair. I've been used for a short time. Kind of down to your shoulders, kind of bothered or something. Or did you? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, it really looks nice down to take I was noticing these, all these women here with their long hair and everything. It looks like, oh, they could be as nice one way as the other, you know, where they had short hair now, but it just looks so, you know, you know what I mean. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> There's that little girl. She's a little bit bashful, is she? Can I ask you, honey? Where's she at? No, you hear tell me? Did you get that? She said we had to wait for Becky to come, so that don't mean you have to go out and start preaching again. <laughs> Has that little girl got pretty hair too, honey? She's a cookie with her little ponytail hanging down there too. A little strawberry blonde. And
go, I'm going to get out and see if that old, uh, get that old Cadillac started if I can, Brother Welsh. I'll, excuse me just a minute, I'll see if I can, sometimes she coughs a little bit and barks, you know. Yeah. Oh, right.